welcome back to another Porsche car whisperer video. Today I'm going to be doing the long-awaited 986 Boxster review. That's good. This car was uh, a savior for Porsche. Back in the early 90s, sales were starting to tank. They were like, uh-oh, what are we gonna do? We need to save the company. So they ended up kind of going back to their roots, back to 550 Spider James Dean, as well as going back to kind of 914 mid-engine style cars. So in 1993, they decided that they were going to finally release a two-door car that was gonna be different from the 911. It was actually released at the Detroit Auto Show in 1993. They ended up hiring uh, some engineers from Toyota to help them really streamline their production as, uh, as far as keeping the cost down. They had just-in-time production, which helped them get rid of any unnecessary parts that they were building and just really help them streamline it so they didn't have uh, a lot of unassociated costs with this car since this was gonna be the savior for Porsche. So this car was ended up being released in 93 as, as I discussed a moment ago, but in 1997 was the first model year. This car was built from 97 all the way up until 2004, considered the 986 Boxster. This variant is a 2000. They did make some decent changes in 2000 from the previous years, what I'll be talking about in a moment. What's really cool, is as far as the front part of the car, it's gonna be very similar to a 911 996 variant. Um, so as you can see, the headlights, front hood, and front bumper, they're all gonna be the same um, on 986 and uh, 911. So that helped them save cost as well with having some of the same components and parts. As far as the front part of the car, going to be a pretty decent size. I put one of my bags in here just so you can see how much. You probably could fit a couple more of these bags. But you can see how big it is. This is the size here. So, you know, if you're going on a long road trip with your wife, you should be able to fit most of hers and your bags. These cars also came with a spare. Most other Porsche sports cars today do not have a spare, so that's something that's, that's kind of rare to the Boxster. So we've got that. And then I'll also show you the rear trunk. So the rear trunk, there's a pretty significant amount of space as well, as well as where you fill the oil coolant and uh, a dipstick. Not too many Porsches have dipsticks. All Porsches now do not have dipsticks, so that's actually nice to have because sometimes with the uh, electronics, people are concerned, is it going to work? So with this, it goes right into the engine and helps it. So, that's nice. Another major difference between a Boxster and a 911, 911's a rear engine. This is gonna be a mid-engine car. It's gonna be right here in the center. It's gonna make the car feel a lot, very nimble and almost like a go-kart, which they feel amazing to me. They drive better than a 911 just because of where the engine is at. In 97, with, the in, with this car being introduced, this car came out with a 2.5 liter flat six engine with about 201 horsepower. They ended up changing that in 2000. Uh, as far as the uh, size of the engine, ended up going up to 2.7, had about 217 horsepower. Something else they did in 2000, 2000 was they introduced the Boxster S. So that had a little bit more horsepower, uh, was, was a little bit different suspension. As far as the outside, pretty much looked the same. A fun fact, the easiest will, the way to be able to tell the difference between a base car as well as an S car differences is gonna be the brakes. So on, on any base car, you're gonna see kind of this flat black brake caliper back there. On a Boxster S, it's actually gonna be red and it's gonna be just a little bit larger, has a little bit different brakes. Those brakes are actually derived from the 911 in the Boxster S. So that's one of the major differences. Now, however, there is something that they've changed here in more recent history. These were black, that was an easy way to tell. Now with the introduction of 992, 911 and 2020, you can now get either red or high gloss version black. So that's kind of the hardest way is now you can't really tell between base and S without maybe looking at the actual car from the inside or even looking at the door panel or the door sill, which you'll see on this, it says Boxster 
on a Boxster S, it'll say Boxster S. So that's maybe the easiest way now to tell the difference between uh, the base as well as the S variant. Um, and then we're going to talk also about the steering wheel. So the steering wheel in this car is the same steering wheel that they had back in 1997 when the car was introduced. Um, it's kind of a four-point steering wheel. They end up going to a three-point steering wheel variant that was also in the Carrera GT starting in 2000 with the Boxster S as well as the Boxster 2001 is kind of when they all started to really have that steering wheel. This car still has uh, the standard steering wheel that the car came with. I think this is a little bit better option if you ask me. I don't really like the way the three-point steering wheel looks. This steering wheel is also actually came from the 993, um, which you don't see too much anymore, of course, and that's the last air-cooled 911. Alrighty. And as you guys know on this channel, I, I love to promote Porsche. Porsche is pretty much my life. Uh, yeah, that's an understatement. Uh, I am going to be talking about some of the weak points on all these cars I end up reviewing. We're obviously going to be starting with this 986 Boxster and all the future cars I review. Myself being a service advisor for Porsche for almost five years, I did kind of get to see a lot of the weak points of cars. Uh, so as a consumer, of course, you need to know what's going to go wrong with the car and kind of when. So I'm going to start off with the front of the car. It also kind of is going to go in conjunction with the steering wheel. Uh, these cars can have the... the horn go out. The horns are actually going to be way up in here. Uh, the cars have a high and low tone horn. A lot of times either one of them will go out or both. Your horn will start to sound really funny. So that's something that you can see uh, as far as a weak point. Kind of also in conjunction with the horn is the horn may go off all the time. Uh, every time you hit the brakes or if you're turning the steering wheel, there is a bracket that actually goes back behind the steering wheel has four little rubber grommets on it and every time you hit the brake those 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 grommets will give a little bit and over time they'll start to wear of course rubber wears over time so every time you hit the brake you're going to be hitting the horn and people are going to be like what the heck is that guy doing so that can happen when you hit the brakes or when you're turning as well because it'll just flex the steering wheel just enough to make the horn go off something else that these cars also have um, some issues with is going to be the water pump uh, probably every 40k you're probably going to start seeing the water pumps go on these cars so that's something to look out for and something else a lot of these cars will also um, go bad is what we call the air oil separator the oil will in turn go into the wrong spot of the engine it'll go into the air intake and on startup a lot of times you'll start the car you'll see a white big white puff of smoke coming out the back or you'll hear a really loud whistling the easiest way to tell if an air oil separator is going bad in these cars is if you if you're hearing a really loud whistling noise if you undo the oil cap the whistling noise will stop that's something to definitely look out for now kind of the elephant in the room is going to be the ims bearing everybody talks about ims bearing when they're talking about 996 986 for intermediate shaft bearing it helps the cams run and it's actually driven by the crankshaft this is not a Part of the engine that's lubricated by any of the other oil it has its own internal uh, lubrication over time this may start to deteriorate if that bearing fails you pretty much have catastrophic failure of the engine hitting the pistons and you're done so and this is the thing the car's already got 50 60 70 thousand miles on it chances are if it hasn't failed by then probably is not going to fail now, I'd be a little bit more weary of a car with a little bit lower miles, you know, 30, 40,000 miles. Possible it may fail. This car, of course, hasn't had a fail yet. It's great. This car is a very low miles car, about 43,000 miles. And, um, then Porsche never ended up coming out with a, it's of a retrofit that kind of angered a lot of consumers. There are a lot of companies out there like LNN Engineering. They do have an updated bearing that you can put in it. It's not 100% foolproof for failing, but that will significantly help. Um, so that's something definitely to think about is if you, if you end up getting one of these cars, has the bearing either been done or has it been updated. Another weak point of these cars would be the coolant tank. The coolant tank is going to be right here. There's uh, a couple different ways you can see if this coolant tank is starting to fail. You'll start to see cracks in the coolant tank. Sometimes you'll also start to get some kind of moisture up here. That could either be coolant tank or potentially a coolant cap. That would be the easiest fix. Um, or uh, a technician can maybe see some leaks f from down below. So that's a, a major thing that uh, a lot of Porsche technicians would find on these cars is also some kind of coolant tank leak. Now, something that we had to do a lot was a key. 
the keys for 996 and 986. You can see this key is right here. These keys a lot of times would start to lose their programming. The light would still light up. However, you wouldn't be able to lock or unlock the car even after replacing the key's battery. So that's something that we found a lot. Only way to fix that is pretty much get a new key. When you get the new key fob from your Porsche service department, make sure that it comes with a key tag and save that key tag. That key tag has the programming code that the, that the technician can then program the key back to the car. On these cars, there is no centralized system where this code is for the particular car. So you have to make sure you keep that little key tag when you have to get a new key. Otherwise, in five years, you're probably going to be doing the same thing, buying a new key and having to get it programmed again with a new fob. That usually runs three or $400 with programming. So I would keep this little key tag. Alrighty, so last but not least, another thing that you see with these cars, as they're now getting older, I mean, a lot of these cars can be 20, 25 years old. There's gonna be some foam that you're gonna kind of see inside of that vent. When you turn the air on, the, the foam will probably start to come out of the car. Don't be alarmed, it's just starting to, to uh, deteriorate over time. Just something that we found um, in the service department as the cars have been aging. One other thing I did want to note, when these cars started getting mass produced because Porsche and the demand was so high, they had to go between Stuttgart and Finland, they weren't checking every engine block carefully like they had been in the past. So every single engine block um, used to be checked. Now they weren't being checked individually and they were getting somewhat porous. So as far as the engines on some of these early cars, they were failing because Porsche wasn't doing quality control in the early years and they weren't checking them just because they really wanted to start producing the cars and getting them out there to the consumer and kind of saving their company, so to speak. So this was the first car that saved Porsche. The second car kind of came in uh, 2003. That was the next hot seller. And we'll talk about that at a later date. All right, so enough of me sitting here and continue to talk about this car. Let's get in it and drive it. We're gonna go on a little drive down into the beautiful Laguna Beach and see how this Boxster handles. Let's go. So this car is a five-speed manual, a lot more sought after than the uh, optional Tiptronic. It's even going to be better than the iconic 911 through the corners all day. Right now with 2020, this particular car is actually about 20 years old. So uh, a, a very fine example uh, of a Boxster, not an S. You can probably find them for somewhere around in the 10 to 15,000 range at most. If you're looking for a Tiptronic and one that has a lot more miles, you're probably going to be looking you know, six, seven thousand dollars. And I feel like right now, that's probably the lowest it'll ever be. And at some point, they'll start going back up just like all the Porsches do at some point. Uh, they usually hit kind of a plateau with as, as much as they are gonna depreciate. And that's about where these cars are now. This little boxer literally feels like a little go-kart as we are going through those hills uh, through Laguna Canyon. With such a low center of gravity and the engine being right behind us, uh, the car feels like it's a go-kart for the street, really. The brakes are absolutely fantastic. It's said that Porsche usually engineers their brakes to be as if the car was twice as powerful. So as far as the stopping power on this car, you don't have to worry about it as long as you service your brakes. Usually brakes on these cars, probably looking at about 30, 35,000 miles, depending on how spirited you're driving the car. 
Um, and it's usually gonna be brake pads, rotors, and sensors. On most other cars, you could do what's called a pad slap. On, on most Porsches, you can't really do that. You might feel some kind of vibration when braking as if the rotors are warped. This is part of the reason I love Porsche, is you just feel so connected to the road. The yeah, Porsche community is uh, very well tight-knit, and it's because everything that we have in common is Porsche and, of course, driving, and everybody's an absolute addict. Do you even need a radio with a car that sounds as good as a Porsche does? I don't think so. did change after this year to start in 2001 was an electronic front trunk switch as well as rear trunk switch right now it's still it's still operated by cable in the year 2000 it was a 996 turbo you can see how it looks very similar to this car and that's kind of that's kind of this car's bigger brother Enough about, enough of sitting here and listening to me just talk about this car. Let's go drive it. <laughs> <laughs> it's better.